Hello, everybody. How is it going? Welcome to D&D Optimized, the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5e. We crunch numbers on them, we theorycraft about them, and basically just try to create a character that's really powerful in-game for the role that we've chosen for it. So, if you enjoy creating characters in Dungeons & Dragons almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game, welcome home. This is where you belong, and we're super happy to have you, so thanks for being here. Uh, my name's Colby, and uh, I'll be your host, I suppose. So, before we jump in to the episode today, just a quick reminder, if you enjoy the content, please do like the video and subscribe to the channel and comment and things, um, and even consider, if you would, uh, joining as a member to support us. It's only a dollar or two a month, currently, and um, I don't offer a lot, frankly. There's a little write-up cheat sheet that I do. Uh, for members that join at the $2 uh, level um, that just kind of walks you through the build, gives you a little, you know, step-by-step -step, um, build guide, as it were. Um, but but that's pretty much it. It's really just a way for you to say, hey, you know, I want to support you. And, and uh, to those who do, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And to those who don't, that's okay, too. I appreciate you being here and just, you know, supporting and subscribing and commenting and all of those things. So you guys are awesome. And last thing I'm going to say about that. So anyway, want to um, make a couple of quick announcements. We do have a lot going on this week. Um, for those who don't know, I can't imagine, but we are starting our very first session of our brand new campaign. Uh, we'll be airing tomorrow. We did the session zero last week for it, the Tales of Anaria. So um, you know, make sure that you uh, that you check out the playlist there, the Tales of Anaria playlist on the channel. And, um, you know, be, be looking for, uh, for session one that's going to be out tomorrow. You know, hit that bell so that you get the notifications if you want to know, like, the second it drops. It should be around 10 o'clock in the morning, mountain daylight time. <laughs> so, anyway, that's exciting. Have some more, actually, really big news and exciting news coming up later this week. Probably on Thursday of this week, as of this recording, which will be May 13th, which is my birthday, actually. So to celebrate my birthday, I'm going to be um, launching kind of a bunch of new content and even rebranding the channel, which is a little bit scary. But anyway, look for more on that, um, some, some notifications and some additional content that I'm going to be putting out and stuff. So anyway, it's been busy, it's exciting, and I'm exhausted, but loving it. I would say probably the oldest, most frequent request that I've that I have been getting and, uh, you know, since I started the channel almost, that I have yet to fulfill is to do a Moon Druid build. Um, there were, the, you know, really all the way back to like last September when the channel was only a few weeks old, I started getting requests and I've been putting it off and putting it off for two primary reasons. One, I felt that to do a Moon Druid build justice I would really need to go through pretty much all of the beasts in the game. <laughs> and it was a little daunting. Uh, it, I, I already spent a lot of time uh, researching and prepping uh, these builds, and, and I was just like, oh, that's just going to be very time consuming. But the other reason uh, was that most people, I think, when they think about a moon druid, they think about them as being a tank, right? because they can be made very difficult to kill. But as we've discussed uh, on several other of my, my tank build episodes, um, it, being hard to kill does not necessarily a good tank make. Um, it's an important aspect of being a tank. But there are a lot of other important things. And, and you know, the common request and, and I think recommendation and expectation for building a good tanky moon druid is to go three levels of bear totem barbarian followed by x levels of druid and then you know you rage and now you have resistance to almost all damage types and then you transform into like the tankiest beast that you can and now you're very very hard to kill because you have a ton of hit points and you have resistance to almost all damage types and i think most of you are maybe anticipating that i do something like that today and spoiler i'm not i think that that yes, that build would be very difficult to kill, but I don't know that that other than being really difficult to kill, 
you bring a lot to the party otherwise with that sort of bear totem barbarian moon druid build. Um, the damage would be okay. You know, you'd get your rage bonus damage and, and you know, you can find beasts that do three attacks in a turn. Um, so adding that on top of it, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. But I don't know that it makes a great tank necessarily. It's tanky, but not uh, necessarily a great tank. Now, of course, there are things that you could do to, to change that, to make you a better tank so that you can protect your allies and encourage enemies to attack you and all those kinds of things. Um, and, and so it's not to say that I won't do a Moon Druid tank build one day. I'm, I'm sure that I probably will eventually. If I do, and when I do, I don't think I'm going to be going Bear Totem Barbarian. I could be wrong. Um, all of that said, of course, if you think that that sounds amazing to just be super hard to kill, to be super tanky, rage, transform into a bear probably, or some other you know animal, and, and just be really hard to kill, and do some okay damage and things, and that sounds really fun to you, then you should absolutely do it. And it would be a viable character, right? There's nothing that would, you know, that, that would make that a not very good character. It would be great. Um, and it would probably be fun, especially if, if that's what you want to do, do it. But that's not what we're going to do with our Moon Druid build today. Um, I really wanted to make a Moon Druid that, um, that can excel at damage, that can excel at sustained DPR, damage per round, which is what I tend to do a lot of, I know. Um, it's, a, it's maybe my, my favorite type of character build, I suppose. And so that, that's what I was most interested in doing. What can I do with the Moon Druid to make them just be really strong damage dealers? Because the tankiness is kind of built in, right, with all the extra hit points that you get when you wild shape. Um, so that's what we're going to do. As a side note, before we jump into the build, uh, one last thing. To play this build like I'm about to suggest is probably going to require a little bit of buy-in from your Dungeon Master for some of you. I don't think that we're going to be making a lot of big asks or, or big stretches to, you know, rules interpretations. But there, there will be some DMs out there that are going to need a little bit of persuading on one or two things. Um, we'll talk about those when we get to them, but just be forewarned uh, that that's coming. So anyway, preamble over. Without any further ado, I present episode 40. Holy cow, episode 40. That that was fast. Um, the Moon Druid. So yeah, let's jump in. All right, at level one. Um, the first rule of Moon Druids, as everybody knows, is to not multi-class a Moon Druid because you want to get to your high level um, beast forms, higher challenge rating beast forms and spells as quickly as possible, right? So at level one, um, we're going Ranger. So <laughs> we get a lot from Ranger uh, and I think it's worth the dip. We'll see if you agree with me by the end. Um, but when we first meet our character, they are a lover of the land, I think. Uh, they are especially fond of animals and they might even fantasize about becoming one sometimes. Um, so for the race, I'm going to recommend Variant Human. There is a feat that's very important to us, so I think it makes the most sense. But if you get a free feat at level one or are looking for an alternative, um, there are a lot of great options. You know, a, a UNT Pureblood or um, a Satyr would be great for the uh, advantage on um, spells, advantage to your saving throws against spells. Um, I like Goliath for some occasional damage resistance, among other things. Um, Mark, of, Mark of Warding Dwarf, if you can play with Eberron, uh, would be nice for access to the Armor of Agathus spell. Uh, there's a lot of other you know, great options. Halfling, you can never go wrong with Halfling Luck, um, etc. But anyway, we're going Variant Human, because I can't assume that you're getting a free feat. And for that free feat, uh, I want to take Resilient Constitution because yes, we have to pay the, uh, the concentration spell tax, as I, as I call it. Um, so an alternative here is to go Warcaster. Um, I, I like Resilient Constitution better because it gives us a plus one to our constitution and then lets us add our proficiency bonus to our constitution saving throws, right? We don't innately have that as a level one ranger or a druid for that matter, if we were to start with druid. Um, so having proficiency in constitution plus, 
you know, a point to our constitution is just nice, and we're not actually going to use a lot from Warcaster. You know, Warcaster gives you advantage on your concentration saving throws. Um, that's great. We don't. We're not going to use the other features there. So I just think Resilient Con is is just a better bet for us here. Um, as far as abilities go, we will take a 15 in our constitution, plus one from the feet, and then a 13 in our dexterity, plus one uh, from our racial, and then a 15 wisdom, plus one for our racial. Um, as for equipment, I'm going to recommend that we go gold buy uh, with the gold buy option here, and then you're going to want to buy scale mail, a shield, two short swords, and either a quarter staff or a club. Um, you're really only going to be using those short swords until the next level. So if you're short on cash, um, you can just try to survive until level two with your club or quarter staff. But keep in mind that you have a terrible, terrible strength score. Um, so you're going to be lousy in combat. Uh, so it's just going to be a matter of, of hanging on until level two. Um, also, as a ranger at level one, we get the Deft Explorer feature. Um, Deft Explorer is a new feature from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that replaces Natural Explorer, and it's one of actually the primary reasons why I wanted to go ranger. Um, you get to have expertise, essentially, in one skill that you're proficient in. Um, you, you get the canny option, and that lets you double your proficiency bonus in one skill that you are proficient in. So. Um, we're going to we're going to double our proficiency bonus in the athletics score. So make sure that between your background and you know the skills that you get proficiency in as a level one ranger, you pick athletics so that we can double our proficiency bonus in athletics. Um, you also get to learn two extra languages, uh, which is a nice little utility bump from uh, from Canny. Um, and then we also at level one get favored foe. Um, Another feature that's new to Tasha's, it replaces favorite enemy. I think it's much better. Um, proficiency bonus times per day. You can mark a target when you hit it. And then the first time that you hit it on each turn until it's dead, basically, um, you do an extra 1d4 of damage. It requires your concentration. It's not. It doesn't take a spell slot, but it does require your concentration. It's not transferable like Hunter's Mark when the enemy dies. Um, you know, you can use it, again, proficiency bonus times per day, but just for that one target. Um, it's not amazing, but it's better than nothing. At level two, um, rangers get a fighting style, and we're going to take the druidic warrior fighting style. Also new to Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, um, it gives you two druid cantrips. And um, the, the only one that I'm going to talk about here is Shilali. So... This uh, this cantrip is fantastic. Um, it lets us imbue our club or quarterstaff uh, so that it's considered magical. It does a d8 of damage, and it lets our lets us use our wisdom modifier to uh, to hit and to damage. Um, we are now in a much better place, uh, and can actually start using our shield now, um, giving us a pretty respectable armor class and decent damage for a level two character. So sell off those sh short swords if you bought them. Um, some may wonder why we would go with Druidic Warrior if, uh, if we're just gonna take Druid levels anyway later. And it's really just to make our early levels stronger. And, and the, other, um, the other fighting styles just weren't amazing for us, for, what, for our stats, for what we're trying to do. Um, if you were going to start this character at level five or later, then I probably would take a different fighting style. Um, maybe blind fighting is, is, I think, what I would probably go with since we don't have dark vision as a variant human, right? And our beast forms uh, won't always have dark vision either. And so being able to see an invisible creature when it's close to you is really nice. Being able to see in the dark at least out to 10 feet um, is, is handy. Uh, as for the second cantrip that we get here, just take whatever looks fun or useful. I'm not going to spend any time talking about any of them. Um, we do get ranger spells now as well, and uh, the two I'm going to recommend are Hunter's Mark and Longstrider. Hunter's Mark, of course, is that quintessential ranger spell. Um, as a bonus action, you mark a target, and from then on, when you hit it with a weapon attack, you do an extra d6 of damage to it. Um, if it dies, as a bonus action, you can transfer it to another enemy. 
Uh, it requires our concentration, of course. Longstrider is not a spell that I've really ever used before. Um, it gives you an extra 10 feet of movement for an hour. Doesn't require concentration, um, so that's nice. We're not going to be using it much yet, but um, I plan on doing so later, so stay tuned. Um, at this point, at level 2, you know, in combat you're just bonus action, hunter's mark on an enemy, and then hitting them for a d8 with your club, plus d6 for hunter's mark, plus your wisdom modifier, uh, and you've got a decent 18 armor class. So you're a, you're a decently strong level 2 character. At level 3, we get primal awareness. Um, again, replacing prime evil awareness, thanks Tasha's. Uh, it basically lets us cast Speak with Animals uh, once per day without using a spell slot, which is some nice little utility. Um, but then we also get our Ranger archetype, our Ranger subclass. And we are going Beastmaster. And honestly, it's, it's as much for numerical reasons as it is for thematic reasons. Because as someone who loves animals as much as you do, and, and, and even wants to become one, it just makes a lot of sense, I think, to have... A, a beast companion, a primal companion, and, and, and we are going with the primal companion option from Tasha's. We are really getting our money's worth out of Tasha's today. Um, so, you know, before Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, I think everybody would readily agree that the Beastmaster was one of, if not the worst, subclasses in, uh, in all of D&D 5e. Tasha's Cauldron of Everything made great strides to improve it. Uh, feel free to check out my, my Beastmaster 2.0 uh, build that I did. Um, and I've used them, you know, on a few builds now. Um, they're they're great. So now, as a as a as a beast companion, a bestial companion, we can we can choose the primal companion option, which is what we're going to be doing. You summon them magically. They're fantastic. Um, we can choose what it looks like, and that's going to be important, at least to me. Um, and we can choose to make them a land or a sky or a sea companion, and each one has its own little perks. Um, we'll be going land, but feel free to take a different route if, uh, if you'd like. From now on, then, as a bonus action, you can have your primal companion make an attack. Um, you could use your action as well if for some reason you needed your bonus action more than you needed your action, right? But we'll assume that we're using our bonus action to have them make an attack. Um, if they die, you can bring them back with just a single spell slot, and it takes a minute. Um, or at the end of a long rest, you can just bring them back without expending any spell slots. Their armor class is, is decent. It's actually a 13 plus your proficiency bonus, which is <laughs> which is better than ours is going to be once we start shapeshifting uh, most of the time. Um, your hit points, their hit points, sorry, are um, five plus five times your ranger level. And so we're not, since we're not going to be taking a ton of ranger levels, it's still going to be a little fragile and will remain so, which might be an argument for instead of going beast of the land, going beast of the sky, because they get the flyby feature where they can swoop in, make an attack, and fly away without taking an opportunity attack. If you have a dungeon master that's prone to attack your little companions, you might want to consider that. Of course, your companion absorbing, you know, an attack from an enemy isn't necessarily a bad thing for everyone other than your companion. <laughs> Um, but anyway, something to consider. Um, the, the land primal companion can potentially knock a target prone uh, if it charges and hits it with an attack. And um, its attack is essentially your spell attack modifier to hit, so that's influenced by wisdom, right? Right now, uh, that's a plus 5 to hit for them. And then if they hit, it, they do a d8 plus 2 plus your proficiency bonus in damage, so that's 8.5 damage on average currently. So again, at level three, we're looking pretty good. We have we now have a weaponized bonus action, um, and we're probably doing better damage than most of our companions. Again, with a decent armor class, um, but our ranger levels are complete for now. So it's time to get going with some moon druid. So at level four, we are a druid one now. Um, your love of nature has sort of overcome your desire to focus on anything else, I think. Um, you, you've got this primal beast and you're developing this bond with them uh, such that you're learning from it, you're connecting with it, um, maybe somehow kind of becoming more and more like it or wanting to become more and more like it. But anyway, as a level one druid, we get a couple of things. Druidic, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a language essentially 
that lets you now like you can you can leave messages with leaves. Get it? I'm sorry. I'm ashamed. <laughs> anyway, uh, you also get druid spells, and uh, you get some cantrips. Take whichever cantrips look look the most fun or useful. Um, but as for first level spells that you get, I'd probably go cure wounds um, for some nice on demand healing when you need it. And probably the Entangle spell, which is a really nice control spell if you wanted to use your concentration, because it requires concentration. If you wanted to use your concentration to restrain, you know, potentially several enemies at once instead of do a little extra damage with Hunter's Mark. Um, with Entangle, vines reach up from the ground in like a 20-foot square, and uh, enemies in the area have to make a strength save or they're restrained. So uh, that, could be, that could be really nice. At level 5, we are a Druid 2, and we get... Wild shape. Finally, you have learned the secret of becoming like your primal companion, only even more powerful. Um, wild shape is fairly complicated, so let's discuss. You can use it twice per short rest um, as an action, or it will actually be a bonus action for us. You can magically assume the shape of a beast that you have seen before. So those are important qualifiers. It has to be a beast type, right? It has to be something you've seen. So keep that in mind. It might be tough to transform into like a dinosaur or something unless you're playing Tomb of Annihilation or the world that you're playing in is, you know, has dinosaurs kind of commonly roaming about or whatever. The beast that you transform into can't have a swim speed until you're Druid level four or a fly speed until you're Druid level eight. Um, you can stay in that form for a number of hours equal to half of your druid levels rounded down. So that's one hour for us currently. Your game stats are replaced by the beasts except for your, well, you keep your alignment, your personality, you keep your intelligence, wisdom, and charisma scores. Um, and you also keep your uh, skill and saving throw proficiencies. You also gain the beast's skill and saving throw proficiencies, if they have any. Um, no legendary or lair actions allowed if the beast has any. Um, you assume their hit points. And if you drop to zero hit points while you're in that form, you transform back into your non-beast form and you take any damage that carries over from whatever took you to zero hit points, right? So if you had like two hit points left in beast form and you got hit for four damage, you'd drop to zero and then take two more damage on top of that in your like humanoid form right you can't cast spells but you can concentrate on spells that you cast before you changed shape and this is one of the main reasons why i didn't want to go barbarian here because as everybody knows when you're raging as a barbarian you can't concentrate on spells and i think that gives up uh, quite a bit of power druids get their subclass at level two and we're going circle of the moon for our druid circle it's really the only circle for those who want to focus on you know enhancing their wild shape capabilities um, we get the combat wild shape feature which allows us like i've mentioned to transform into a beast as a bonus action instead of an action which is super nice and then while we're transformed we can spend a spell slot um, we can use a bonus action to spend a spell slot to heal ourselves for 1d8 per spell level of the spell slot that uh, we expended, and that's fantastic and will really help um, our survivability and help us stay in beast form, right? We get the circle forms feature, which allows us to transform instead of to a beast of a quarter challenge rating or less. Right now, for us, it's a challenge rating of one or less, which is way, way better, and it will scale. Uh, more on that later. So recommended beasts i need to recommend you know what beasts we're going to be transforming into um i have two to mention the first is the brown bear the second is the giant spider uh brown bear is my favorite for us here especially for what we're going to try and do um they have an 11 armor class 34 hit points um they have a multi-attack bite and claw and good strength and constitution scores which are all important for us as as we will discuss in a minute when we get to level six um giant spider is kind of an honorable mention for me their their bite attack that they have does really good damage if your target fails a constitution saving throw against poison 
Um, they also have a web attack that's that's kind of okay as long, well, it, it will restrain a target. Um, it's fairly easy to get out of, but of course they would have to spend an action trying to do so. So anyway, uh, that can be kind of nice. So I like the giant spider. I just like the, the, the brown bear more for what we're trying to do. At level six, you're a druid three. You get second level spells, and we're gonna make sure that we take Spike Growth and Moonbeam. Um, let's talk about Spike Growth. It requires concentration. It lasts for 10 minutes. Um, when you cast it, the ground in, at, in a point of your choosing, the ground in a 20 foot radius or a 40 foot circle um, becomes covered in hard spikes and thorns. It is difficult terrain, and for every five feet that a creature moves in it, it takes 2d4 piercing damage. No saving throws or anything, they just take that damage. Um, I get a ton of requests for, for, um, for an Eldritch Blast spike growth build where you're hitting them with Eldritch Blast and pushing them and pulling them and dragging them back and forth on the spike growth and they do tons of damage. I, I'm, I'm familiar with the idea. I like the idea. I will get there one day. But I've been doing a lot of Warlocks lately and I wanted to get to Moon Druid first. So anyway, this is, this is the level where everything sort of comes together. The plan from here is to do the following. On turn one, you cast Spike Growth as strategically as possible for your action. So in other words, you know, get as many enemies as you can inside of it and or you know, place it strategically between your melee enemies and your, you know, your ranged companions, right? Um, and then as a bonus action, you transform into a bear. Turn two, you run up, you grapple an enemy, and you start dragging them across the thorns. Um, and then as a bonus action, you have your land beast, your primal companion, attack your grappled target. Oh, and by the way, I really think your primal companion needs to be a little bear. Because then you can be the mama bear, and you have a little baby bear, and you'll be the most adorable and terrifying duo ever. Um, so on subsequent turns, you attack them with your bite and your claw, uh, as in bear form, right? And again, keeping them grappled, you continue dragging them across the thorns with your baby bear, making attacks for your bonus action. And here is where we need to pause for a moment and talk about some things that you may need to get buy-in from your dungeon master before you create and try and play this character. Um, first up, grappling. So for those who watched um, my sliding into my DMs video last week, right there, um, now you know why I wanted to talk about grappling bears. Um, the question that I posed to my dungeon masters was, can a bear grapple? Um, I, think, I think anyone who's familiar with actual bears in the real world would say, yes, of course they can. There's a reason they call it a bear hug, right? Um, however, there is the potential that your DM might get hung up on wording in the rules that would lead them to say that a bear cannot grapple in-game. Um, I'm not going to rehash the argument here in the interest of time, but if you want to see us hash it out, you know, check out the video and just watch the first few minutes. We only talk about it for the first few minutes, so go check it out there. I remain convinced that the vast majority, I have to believe, that the vast majority of DMs running campaigns for D&D 5th edition would be okay letting you grapple as a bear. Um, but double check with your DM just to be safe. One thing that I didn't mention in that uh, DM's video because it didn't seem necessary was, for what it's worth, um, Mike Merles, one of the creators of D&D 5th edition, was asked if bears can grapple in a tweet, and he responded, yes, they could. I know. Mike Merles and Jeremy Crawford, for that matter, uh, their tweets aren't supposed to be taken as official rulings necessarily. Um, sometimes they even contradict one another. But you know, if you if you need maybe additional fuel to help try and convince your DM, there's potentially a little additional fuel. Um, now, just in case your DM decides that for some reason bears can't grapple, um, I will give you an alternative beast with every challenge rating as we go uh, to, to use instead. At this level, it would be uh, the giant Roctopus. So, uh, giant Roctopus has an attack that if it hits, automatically grapples a target. 
and you would simply in that case grapple them and hold them in the moonbeam spell instead of using spike growth um, because rock, giant octopus only has 20 feet of move speed and so you can only move at half speed when you're dragging an opponent that you have grappled so you just wouldn't get much mileage out of spike growth in that scenario um, so you just hold him in Moonbeam in instead. Um, yes, I know Giant Roctopus can only breathe underwater, but as per the rules, with a plus one to its constitution, which is now your constitution if you transform into it, um, the Giant Roctopus can hold its breath for two minutes, which should be enough to get through any co any combat encounter. Um, it's it's less damage overall going this route, but if you can't if you can't be a grappling bear there's an alternative. So, assuming that we're good to do some bear grappling here then, uh, let's be clear on how grappling works. In order to grapple, we make an athletics check against our opponents, either athletics or acrobatics check, their choice, and the, the highest, you know, the highest, the highest check wins. And if we win, they're grappled. And if they win, they're not grappled. Um, but so the question is, how do we calculate the bonus to our athletics check. It gets a little tricky. Um, there are some differing opinions out there, but as far as I can tell, what's most commonly agreed to by the community and by Jeremy Crawford as well, is that if you're proficient in athletics, and we are, you'd take your proficiency bonus and add it to the beast's strength bonus to get your total athletics bonus. Some of you are typing furiously right now. <laughs> I can feel it. I can feel it from here. Here is a relevant quote from Jeremy Crawford on um, the Sage Advice segment of Dragon Talk. He says, You get to use your proficiency bonus, but you do use the creature's dexterity modifier. They were talking about stealth here, but the point is the same. Okay. Back to the quote. This is where it gets tricky. Use your proficiency bonus for anything where you are both proficient, but only if yours is higher but you use the physical stats of the beast, okay? So this is why we wanted to go Ranger 1, at least, and, uh, and get Canny so badly, because it lets us double our proficiency bonus in athletics, meaning that at level 6, we have a proficiency bonus of 3, which we would double to 6 for athletics, right? And then we would add that 6 to the plus 4 bonus from the bear's 19 strength giving us a total athletics check bonus of a plus 10. We should very rarely fail our grapple checks. That's very that's a very strong, you know, athletics bonus as a level 6 character. Um, I'm sure that some of you will want to argue about this in the comments. Please do so. It's it's great for my algorithm. <laughs> Similarly, keep in mind that when you calculate your constitution saving throws and therefore our concentration checks, um, you will add your proficiency bonus, because we took Resilient Constitution, so we're proficient in Constitution saving throws, to the Beast's Constitution modifier, uh, which is a plus three in the Brown Bear's case, for a total of plus six to our Constitution saving throws. Also, when I did my Thornlock build, um, several of you were asking in the comments how we could grapple someone and hold them in a bonfire, uh, without taking damage ourselves. So let's address this. Uh, rules is written. Again, as far as I can tell, when you grapple a creature, you don't actually technically share their space. Uh, you know, assuming you're playing on a grid, everybody's got their own five foot square, right? Medium creatures anyway. So if you're grappling them and you're holding them in a spell effect, you don't necessarily occupy the creature's space and therefore the same space of that spell effect as long as you're standing. If you're standing outside the spell effect, they're standing inside of it, right? Um, maybe I think the way to think about it is that you're like, maybe you've got them in a headlock and you're sort of holding, you know, their feet or, you know, the bottom half of their, their, uh, their body in, you know, a spell effect area. Or maybe, you know, you're kind of grappled with them and you're sort of pushing their, pushing their face into the, into the spell effect area. Or in, in our case, you know, you've got them, you're dragging them along the edge of the area, the spike growth area, right? But you're, doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily walking through the thorns as well. You're just sort of dragging them along the edge of it and they're like, ow, 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 ow. quit it, right? Um, if you think your DM might take umbrage with this idea, discuss it with them. In fact, discuss it with them to make sure that they won't, I suppose I would say. Um, but again, 
as far as I can tell, rules as written, you don't occupy the space of the enemy that you're grappling. Um, now, also, <laughs> I need a nap. Keep in mind that when you have a target grappled, you can drag them, but you can only move at half speed, like I've mentioned. Fortunately for us, we are a brown bear, and brown bears have 40 feet of move speed. Um, so that means we could potentially drag them, uh, you know, drag an enemy along the spike growth for 20 feet, and they take, you know, uh, 2d4 of damage for every 5 feet that they travel, so that would be 8d4 of damage if you moved them, you know, if you drug them along the edge of the spike growth uh, for, for 4 squares, as it were. Alternatively, as I've mentioned, you could use the Moonbeam spell. Um, Moonbeam is just a five foot radius circle, so it's like a, you know, a two by two square on the grid, essentially. Um, and it's a cylinder that's 60 feet tall, and it does radiant damage. When you first cast the spell over someone, and when they start their turn there, it, re it requires concentration, but and when they start their turn there, they'll take 2d10 radiant damage if they fail a constitution saving throw. Um, and half if they succeed, of course. It, it's nice to get some damage right off the bat, um, but the con save is a bummer because, you know, a lot of enemies in D&D have a pretty high uh, constitution saving throw. Even if they fail the save, it's actually, at this level, less damage than 20 feet of movement through spike growth would be. Um, you know, it's 11 damage on average for a failed moonbeam saving throw versus 20 damage on average if they move through 20 feet of spike growth. But but it is an option to use if you wanted to use it. Whew. Okay, let's do a damage report at level 6. So when I'm crunching the numbers here, um, I'm going to be talking about rounds where you are grappling a target, you're dragging them through spike growth, and you're making your bear attacks, a claw and a bite, and uh, you're getting your little baby bear attacks in as a bonus action. I'm also assuming that you have Long Strider active on yourself, um, giving you 50 feet of move speed in bear form or 25 feet of dragging along spike growth here. Again, of course, I realize that's not always going to happen. You know, if combat starts and you don't already have Long Strider on yourself, don't bother. Just know that your damage is going to be a little bit less. Um, but all of those things combined, you're putting a lot of holes in your enemies. So against an enemy with a 10 armor class, uh, you're going to be doing 50 damage per round. And against an enemy with a 15 armor class, it will be 43 damage per round. That's very nice. Um, it's quite comfortably near the top when compared to other, you know, T1, uh, Tier 1, I should say, sustained uh, damage per round builds that I've done at this level. And again, if you want to see those comparison charts, Tier 1, Tier 2, sustained DPR, check the, uh, check the video description. And it's all, all the math is, is there for you to see. At level 7, you are a Druid 4. We get our first ability score increase, or feat. Um, you could make a strong argument, I think, to take the mobile feat here. Uh, it gives you 10 more feet of move speed, among other nice features, and that would mean, you know, five more feet of dragging an enemy through spike growth. Um, the problem with spike growth, though, is that it doesn't scale. You know, you can't upcast it for more damage, and so we will eventually be leaving it behind, uh, and our move speed will become a little less important when we get higher levels. So I'm gonna I'm gonna recommend bumping wisdom here for a, our ability score increase to an 18, as that will um, increase our spell difficulty check, but also um, our baby bear's hit chance. Um, also, wanted to mention, you can now, as a Druid 4, wild shape into beasts that have a swim speed. Um, and so there is a possible alternative beast that you could transform to here, um, the Giant Toad. Uh, I actually used this in my Beastmaster 1.0 build, which hardly anybody watches. <laughs> I was very proud of it, but it was, ooh, it, was work, it was like working with one hand tied behind my back. But anyway, it, it's potentially nice. Uh, so, anyway, you make a bite attack as a giant toad, and if it hits, then your target is grappled and restrained, kind of like the Roctopus. Um, that's nice, and then on your next turn, if it's still grappled, you make another bite attack against it, and if you succeed, then you swallow them. Um, the grapple ends, and you're free to grapple someone else now, uh, while the first one slowly just melts to death in your stomach. <laughs> 
I wonder how they taste. Um, it's a great way to get someone out of the fight, but but they can still attack you while they're in your stomach. They just they're restrained and blinded, so they would have disadvantage on those attacks. But you have a fairly low armor class, so you know you're probably going to be taking some damage there. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, I wanted to sort of talk about a lot of monsters and all of these alternative monsters that I'm going to be mentioning for those who can't grapple as a bear. You know, they have these attacks that if the attack hits, then the target is grappled. And that's great because you get to do damage and grapple them all with one attack, right? The, the problem with really all of them is they tend to have a lower to hit chance and the, the, they, get a, they get a DC... Um, a set DC in order to try and break the grapple on their turn, as opposed to, you know, having an athletics or acrobatics check against your athletics check. And and that's always, for us, going to be worse than, you know, the big athletics check bonus that we were getting. So, for example, the giant toad here, um, the DC for them to escape is only a 13, and that's not great, especially since they get to choose athletics or acrobatics, right? So the likelihood that by the second round they will still be grappled is not fantastic. Um, when it works, it will be really cool and hilarious for you to just be swallowing your enemies. Um, but I would probably only take the toad, the giant toad route on creatures that you're pretty sure have both a weak athletics and acrobatics check. At level eight, you are a druid five and you get third level spells. Um, you know, knock yourself out. There are a lot of great druid spells here. Choose the ones that feel most powerful or fun to you. We're going to be relying on spike growth still for concentration. I know some of you are going to want to talk about conjure animals. And without getting into it, I will just say that if you have a DM who gives you good animals or lets you pick them, better yet, and you're up against an enemy that isn't resistant to non-magical attacks, and they have a relatively low or medium AC, and you've got room to actually maneuver eight additional animals, and your party won't hate you for it, go ahead and use this spell for your concentration, and uh, and then you don't have to worry about grappling. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan, as I'm sure you guys can tell, because I never use it in any of my builds, for similar reasons to the problems that I think you get with the Necromancer. Uh-oh. I'm going to run out of cards. Um, but you just instantly have 8 and later 16 and, and 24 and 32. It's just, it's, it's, it's too much, I think. I don't like this spell. Some of you love it, and if you do, go for it. At level 9, you are a druid 6. And uh, speaking of resistance to non-magical attacks, you get Primal Strike, which, you know, tells us that our beast attacks are now, you know, they now count as magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance. That's great. And then we get a circle forms upgrade. So from now on, we can transform into beasts whose challenge rating is equal to our druid level divided by three rounded down. So at druid six, we can go with a challenge rating two beast. At druid nine, we can go with a challenge rating three beast, etc. So what should we be transforming into now uh, at level nine? I would say our number one option would be a cave bear or a polar bear. Uh, they're basically the same. They're just, they just look a little different. Um, and and they, are, they are basically an upgrade to the brown bear. Uh, they have a higher strength score and thus uh, grapple check, bringing our grapple check now actually to a plus 13 um, since our proficiency has also gone up since we checked last time. Uh, they have more hit points. They do more damage. One thing that I've been failing to mention, by the way, brown bears and cave bears and polar bears are large creatures. Um, and remember that you can only grapple a creature that is uh, one size bigger than you or smaller. So as a large creature, you could grapple a huge creature here, uh, which is awesome. You know, right from the get-go, you can do that. If, uh, so if the grappling bear thing is not going to work, um, you've got a couple of alternatives here. The giant constrictor snake, um, they can take the constrict action and you basically make an attack and if it hits, you damage them and grapple them, right? And, and restrain them. Um, and so then, you know, on subsequent turns, you'd be making attacks if they remain grappled, of course, you'd be making attacks with advantage. Um, bite attacks, and they do pretty decent damage, and the the escape DC is, is a fairly respectable 16, um, so it's actually a pretty decent option. 
Um, the, the, the other honorable mention I guess I'd give would be the giant crayfish. Only because it can make two attacks with its claws, and, and, they, and they both can grapple. So you could like try and grapple one target, and then it's like a multi-attack. Try and grapple a second. You know, Again, if the hit lands, they're grappled and restrained. Um, the problem with the giant crayfish, it's only a plus four to hit, which is pretty weak. Um, and the escape DC is only a 12, which is really weak. Um, so again, it would really only work on super easy to grapple targets. But if the attacks land, they are grappled until their turn. So at least for one glorious turn, you could potentially like grapple a couple of enemies and drag both of their faces along the spike growth, and it would be beautiful and hilarious. So um, let's check in with a damage report at level 9. Um, you know, the, the tactic is still essentially the same. Against an enemy with a 10 armor class, you would be doing 55 damage per round, and against an enemy with a 16 armor class, you would be doing 46 damage per round. Um, we've gone up some, it's still quite good, but we have started to plateau a little bit, uh, like moon druids usually do. One thing I will mention here, the cave bear has 42 hit points, which uh, is not bad, but only a 12 armor class, which means that at level nine, you're gonna be getting hit a lot. Um, especially if you're grappling an enemy and they decide to just attack you instead of try and break your, gra their, your grapple uh, you know, on their turn. Um, fortunately, we've got a respectable plus concentration, well, our plus constitution save and therefore concentration checks as a cave bear will be a plus seven. So we should hold on to our concentration most of the time. But the real danger here, I think, is in dropping to zero hit points in bear form and, and then dropping out of bear form in our wild shape, right? So don't forget to heal yourself as a bonus action with your spell slots when you need to. Remember, uh, you know, 1d8 per spell of, of healing per spell slot level expended. At level 10, we are a druid 7, and that means we get 4th level spells. Um, the only one that I'm going to talk about is Wall of Fire. There are, there are a lot of great spells here, um, especially for support and control, which is where I think the druid spell list really shines. Um, so make sure that you're picking some of these up along the way and using them, you know, either out of combat or even in combat if you're out of wild shape forms and, and a fight breaks out, right? Um, but Wall of Fire is really great for what we're trying to do, and it will eventually take the place of spike growth. Um, maybe not at this level. The way it works is uh, this. Well, it requires concentration. You cast it, and it's a 60-foot wall uh, or a 20-foot in diameter circle. 20 feet high, uh, it's one foot thick, and you can't see through it. So it will block line of sight. You choose a side of the wall that's hot, and when you first cast it, anyone in the area, and thereafter anyone uh, you know within 10 feet of the hot side uh, has to make a dexterity saving throw or they take 5d8 of damage, um, half on a save. Uh, it can be a really great way to discourage enemies from getting to you too quickly uh, and from seeing you and making ranged attacks. For right now, it's a little less damage than our spike growth, assuming we have 50 feet of move speed with long strider and a grappled target. Um, plus, our enemy doesn't get a saving throw if we're dragging them through spike growth. Um, but this will change eventually, and, and it will get to the point where Wall of Fire um, does, uh, does more damage. At level 11, we are a Druid 8. We get another ability score increase or feat, and I'm going to recommend bumping our Wisdom so that it's, at, it's capped now at 20. Um, and that's really nice, especially now that we're going to be benefiting a little more from our spell DC, right? And plus one... Uh, more to hit for a baby bear is fantastic. Um, we do get fifth level spell slots now, and I wanted to mention this. Uh, again, because we've multiclassed as a ranger, right, and we have some ranger levels, even though we're only a druid eight, we do have fifth level spell slots, we just don't have any fifth level spells yet. Um, and that's important because it would allow us potentially to upcast Wall of Fire for 6d8 of damage, and now it just barely takes the lead in damage if the enemy fails their saving throw. And, you know, over spike growth. Um, it is a deck save, and most enemies don't have a really high deck save, so, you know, you've got a pretty good likelihood with your high wisdom that they would fail. Um, but something else to keep in mind with Wall of Fire. They, they take the damage when the wall first appears, if they're in the area, um, but after that, they only take the damage at the 
end of their turn if they're within 10 feet of the hot side, right? Assuming then that you've, you've got them grappled and kind of holding them close. Uh, on the other hand, Moonbeam, though it has less control functionality and a much smaller area, would do 5d10 of damage as a fifth level spell. Just a teeny bit higher on average, but it does scale a little better. Um, but with Moonbeam, they take the damage at the start of their turn. So if you think that the enemy is likely to break your grapple, especially if you're if you know if you can't bear grapple and you're going one of these other um, you know one of these alternate beasts um, that have a lower DC for for their grapple check, you might be better off with Moonbeam. That way, at least you know you hit them, you've got them grappled, you're holding them. They're gonna take the damage at the beginning of their turn, even if they break that grapple and and then move. Um, of course, Moonbeam is a Constitution saving throw, uh, which is generally going to be worse for us than the wall of fire dexterity save so you know just be aware of your options know your enemy um one other note at druid 8 we can wild shape into flying beasts now uh we probably won't be in combat but uh it's really nice to be able to do so in a pinch for utility and or exploration at level 12 you are a druid 9 and we get fifth level spells now Normally, fifth level spells are a big deal for casters, but for our purposes, our options are a little underwhelming. Granted, there are a lot of great support and control and utility options, which you should definitely take and use. For damage, maybe an option would be Wrath of Nature um, if you're outside and there are like a lot of trees and roots and rocks around, but otherwise, probably sticking with Wall of Fire here. We also get to transform now into Challenge Rating 3, beasts. Um, I'm going to talk about two. So it, neither of these, frankly, I think are, are a no-brainer upgrade to the cave bear. There's kind of some pluses and some minuses. Um, the first one, let's talk about the Amphis Bena. Um, Amphis Bena. Anyway, it's identical to the giant constrictor that we talked about earlier in, in every way except for one very important one, and that is it has a multi-attack. And one of those attacks can be the constrict attack, meaning you could hit them with a constrict attack, doing damage and grappling and restraining them, and then on that same turn, make a bite attack against them. Now with advantage, um, you know, all in, all in one turn for, for pretty decent damage. Um, it's definitely potentially a stronger second round of combat option than, than the cave bear, um, assuming that you can also hold them in range of the firewall, the wall of fire damage. And and remember, you know, enemies, restrained enemies have disadvantage on dexterity saves, so there's a really good chance that if you hit and grapple and restrain your target with that constrict attack, um, they're going to fail their dex save and take full damage from, from the wall of fire. The, the problem is, you know, again, we've talked about how rules as written, um, you don't occupy the same space as your enemy. I can definitely see a DM being like, you're a snake constricting your target. You're, you are like wrapped around them. If they are in the spell effect of an area, if they're, if they're in the area of a spell effect, you are too, like rules as written be damned, right? Um, and, and yeah, I could definitely see that happen. I mean, maybe not. Maybe you're making an argument, well, I've just got their head wrapped and tangled and their, you know, their, their feet and their butt are in, are close to the fire. You know, I don't know. Again, something you'd have to work out with your DM, but that's a potential problem here. Also, of course, the DC for them to escape your grapple is only a 16. And at this level with monsters getting to choose athletics or acrobatics, it's a lot more likely that they'll break uh, break the grapple on their turn, meaning your damage would actually be quite a bit lower than it would with the bear. But the the Amphisbina is um, quite a bit tankier. Um, they're giant sized. That's cool. Their attacks do more damage. Um, and 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 here's the thing: you are a level twelve character, right? Enemies are getting really dangerous at this level. If you can get an enemy to spend its action breaking your grapple. Even if they succeed, that's a huge win for your team. Um, I mean, so either they waste their action uh, breaking the grapple because they don't want to take damage from the wall of fire, um, and you know, on the next turn you can hopefully just grab them again, right? Um, or they take a bunch of damage from the wall of fire. So either way, you win, and that's what I love about it. An alternative to the Amphisbina here um, is the giant scorpion. 
at first glance, I love this beast. Um, it's it's like the giant crayfish in that it gets to make you know a grapple with each of its claws and potentially restrain and grapple you know two enemies if the attacks land. But but it's better than the giant crayfish in that it also has the stinger and it can make as a third attack uh, it can make a stinger attack. Um, ideally against a target that it has grappled in its claws that's restrained and therefore you have advantage on the attack. Um, and if it hits, it could potentially do big uh, physical and poison damage combined. The problem is that, you know, the poison aspect of that stinger attack is a con save, uh, which is not great for us, and it's only a DC of 12, so most enemies are probably going to resist that, though they do take half damage if they save, so it's still pretty good damage even if they make that save, as long as they're not immune to poison, which, as we know, a lot of enemies are. Um, but those claw attacks are only a plus four to hit. And again, the escape DC is only a 12. I, you know, I could live with an easy escape um, for the same reasons that I, that I just mentioned, right? If, if you're getting an enemy to use its action um, to escape your claws, that's, that's great. It's a win. But, but at a plus four to hit and a pretty low DC con save for the poison damage, it just makes me feel like the giant scorpion would probably be a pretty niche choice. Um, you know, maybe used against only against easy to hit targets at least, if not, you know, easy to grapple ones with with a low con save or whatever. Um, and in those cases, it will be amazing. At level thirteen, we are a druid ten, and we get the elemental wild shape feature. Da da da. Okay, here we go. So, at the cost of both our uses of wild shape, which really hurts. Um, we can potentially transform into an air, earth, fire, or water elemental, which is sweet. Um, all of them do really cool things and nice damage. My favorite, for our purposes, is the earth elemental. So they have a 17 armor class. Nice. They have 126 hit points. Sweet. They have a plus 5 to their strength and their constitution bonuses. They are resistant to damage from bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing. Um, which, again, as I've said in many times in the past, is most of the damage that you take as a character in D&D. Um, they are immune to poison and a bunch of conditions that I'm not even going to mention. They have dark vision, they have tremor sense, um, and they can burrow through stone and make two big damage slam attacks per turn. So they're very, very, very strong. The question, of course, is should you blow both of your wild shape uses um, to transform into one? And I can't answer that question for you. Uh, when I crunch the numbers for this, uh, for, for our level 13 damage report, I am going to assume that you're an earth elemental. But unless, of course, you're getting a short rest after every combat encounter, right? You're going to be playing a very different character in subsequent encounters until you get a rest. Some of you, for that matter, might not be getting a short rest every two combat encounters anyway, so we are going to have to deal at some point with figuring out what to do when you're out of wild shape uses. And to be honest with you, there's a ton you can do. I mean, you are a high-level caster character after all, with a fantastic suite of control and support spells especially, but even some damage spells. So, you know, have fun with it. Um, keep in mind, you've probably got spell slots to spare when you're not in wild shape form because, uh, you know, when you are transformed, you're using one spell slot for like a high damage concentration spell, right? And then maybe some spell slots to heal yourself along the way. Um, but otherwise, you should have some, some spell slots left over. And to be honest with you, kind of like I s talked about in the Mercy Monk video, uh, if I have any cards left, <laughs> uh, last week, I kind of love the idea of mixing it up in combat, um, and 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 for this character in particular, like your combat is going to vary widely, potentially from encounter to encounter. You know, one encounter or two encounters, you're going to be transformed into something. Okay, so in our case, one encounter, you're going to be an elemental, an earth elemental, grappling enemies, pummeling them, holding their face to the hot side of a raging wall of fire, and then the next, you're standing at the back, you're controlling the enemies, you're locking them down, you're healing, you're buffing your allies, you're throwing out, you know, an occasional damage spell. To me, it sounds like a great way to keep the game sort of fresh and interesting, from even from encounter to encounter. It's almost like you've got two characters that you're playing, 
uh, and, and you know you get some nice variety that way to, to keep things fresh. Damage report at level 13, assuming you are an earth elemental who's slamming, making two slam attacks against their grappled target, holding their face to the hot side of a firewall, um, which you can cast at 6th level now, by the way, for 78 damage, uh, with your little baby elemental making its attacks because you can change the primal beast's form. Um, so, you know, make, make it a little baby elemental now. And um, yeah, it's making a bonus action attack. So uh, all of those things happening against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their dexterity saving throw, uh, you're doing 68 damage per round, and against an enemy with a 17 armor class and a plus seven to their dexterity saving throw, it's 49 damage per round. Also, keep in mind that, um, of course, ideally, you're going to be hitting multiple targets with that wall of fire when you first cast it, right? So even though these numbers that I'm reporting on, it may take you a round or two to actually get to those numbers, um, Round one should actually be really, really strong because, you know, obviously depending on how, how many enemies you can catch, uh, you know, within your, your wall of fire. But I, I have to assume that most of the time you're going to be getting at least two of them, if not more. So uh, that's a potential lift to the figures, at least in the first round. At level 14, we are a Druid 11 which means that we get six level spells. And the only one I'm gonna mention, even though there are lots of great options here, um, but the only one I'm gonna mention is the Wall of Thorns. So Wall of Thorns is the same as Wall of Fire in almost every single way, um, damage, dimensions, etc. cetera, um, except for that it does add an additional control aspect to your wall. So it's five feet thick, and for every foot of move speed, that a creature makes to try and get through it. It has to spend four feet of move speed, essentially. So it would take them 20 feet of move speed to get through your wall. So if you can put it 10 feet in front of them and they only have 30 feet of move speed, they're going to end their turn in the middle of the wall and take damage. They'll take damage when they first, you know, kind of try and walk through it, but then if they end their turn there, they'll take damage as well. Um, so it will likely prevent enemies that are behind it from getting through or around the wall uh, to make an attack for at least a turn. And of course you can cast it in a circle and sort of force enemies to either stay there or just take damage, you know, trying to get through. At level 15, we are a Druid 12. Uh, we get another ability score increase or feat, and I think I'm going to take Warcaster here just to make sure that I really hardly ever drop concentration because we get advantage on our concentration checks and some other things that don't really help us out very much. You guys are probably familiar with Warcaster. I'm not going to get into the details. Um, we also get uh, we also get to transform now as a Druid 12 into challenge rating four beasts. Um, Here's something for those stingy DMs who don't want to let anything grapple that specifically doesn't have hands. Um, everyone's familiar with the Loxodon race, yes? Uh, Loxodons are basically bipedal elephants, right? They have a cool little feature that lets them use their trunk to grapple an enemy. As a level 12 moon druid, you can wild shape into an actual elephant that also has a trunk. Can we not grapple with it because the trunk is not a hand? Let's stop being silly, okay? Elephants are a great option here if you don't want to burn both of your wild shapes on an earth elemental. Um, they're decently tanky, they have solid damage, they have a plus six strength bonus, so assuming we can grapple, and honestly, like, only the stingiest, most stubborn DM would not let you grapple with your trunk as an elephant, I think. But anyway, um, <laughs> a plus six to our strength bonus. So assuming we can grapple right now, we'd be looking at a plus 16 to our athletics check. Um, plus, you're a huge size. So, you know, a good go-to if you need to grapple a gargantuan creature. My, I think my favorite option here, though, as a go-to, might be um, the giant subterranean lizard. Now, one note, these beasts are starting to get a little exotic. You might not have seen an elephant uh, before as a creature, or or a, even probably less likely to see a giant subterranean lizard. So um, if you're planning on trying to take one of these, uh, you know, as a, as a potential option for, the, for your wild shape, you might need to come up with a really great backstory to explain to your DM why you've seen these creatures before. Um, or, you know, try and convince your DM to let you fight one in, in your campaign, maybe. 
Um, but as for the giant subterranean lizard, if you remember the giant toad and its sweet swallow action, this thing has it as well, but um, it has a much better plus to hit, uh, it has a much better DC to get out of the grapple. But best of all, though, is that it has a multi-attack, and one of those attacks can be the swallow attack. So now, if you hit a creature with your bite, you don't even have to wait until your next turn, you know, hoping that it doesn't break your still relatively low DC of 15 uh, grapple check. Instead, you just make a bite attack. If it hits, they're grappled and restrained. And then, as long as they're medium size or smaller, on that same turn, you make a swallow attack with advantage because they're restrained, right? And if it hits, they are in your belly. Get in my belly! Um, so they take 3d6 acid damage each turn while they're down there, and again, blinded, restrained. Um, they, they can't escape unless you die. And so, speaking of, um, again, word of caution, if you go this route, they could very well be attacking you from inside, and, and even though, you know, they're restrained and at disadvantage, your AC as a giant subterranean lizard is only a 12, so you're likely going to be taking damage from inside, and then, you know, if you've got another target grappled from outside, you're probably going to be taking damage there, so you're likely going to be needing to use your bonus action, like, in spell slots every turn, or almost every turn, to heal yourself, um, because you don't want to drop to zero. And in fact, that begs the question, what happens if you have swallowed a creature and you drop to zero as a giant subterranean lizard and then transform back into a humanoid? Um... I don't know the answer, so tune in later this week for our Sliding Into My DMs episode where we ask that question. <laughs> At level 16, um, having learned what we could from our deeper study of nature, uh, our character feels compelled to return to the ranger path uh, to further enhance our martial ability, maybe, or perhaps we're nearing the end of our character's story and we're on the trail of an enemy. Uh, that we've been chasing this whole time and we want to find ways to improve our tracking abilities or something. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure, but we've got great mechanical reasons for finishing the build with a couple more ranger levels. So at ranger four, we get an ability score increase or feat that we never got from ranger. Um, I'm going to recommend the piercer feat. Um, this is going to give us a slight damage bump and I'll explain a little bit more about that next level. If you don't love the choice, feel free to take something else. You know, mobile, if you really like dragging enemies through thorns more than holding them still in, in an area of effect, you know, spell, um, plus constitution to, you know, improve your uh, out of wild shape health and saving throws. Fey touched would be nice for, you know, a free misty step casting, among other things. Telekinesis to maybe... Uh, you know, shove an enemy deeper into your briar patch, your wall of thorns, or your spike growth, or something. Great options, knock yourself out. Um, we also, you know, as per Tasha's, can now, when we when we get an ability score increase or feat in ranger levels, we can swap our fighting style. <clears throat> and, you know, we have plenty of druidic cantrips at this point. Druidic warrior, probably a little redundant. So I would switch to something maybe like blind fighting, I mentioned at the beginning. Um, provides some nice utility, lets you fight in darkness, see invisible creatures that are close to you. Um, you know, your DM may rule that blind fighting counts as a special senses and is therefore not transferable to your wild shape form. Um, I suppose I would argue that, you know, the reason you can sort of have this blind fighting ability is more a result of your martial training, and then it's not really necessarily a special sense like dark vision, but, you know, there will be people who disagree. Um, in that case, feel free to do something else like, you know, take the defense fighting style to raise your armor class by one when you're out of, out of wild shape, etc. Finally, for us, at level 17, we are a ranger 5 which means we get second level ranger spells. Um, I would say it's, it's your choice. I don't think there are actually any second level ranger spells that you don't already have access to from druid levels. I could be wrong there, uh, but from your druid spells. We also, as a fifth level ranger, get the extra attack feature. So here's the thing. I think that the elephant is our best option for beast for what we want to do. Um, 
you know, if earth elementals only cost one use of our wild shape feature, then sure, they're, they're stronger. But the elephant is tanky, they're super strong, um, they're huge size, and I'm, I have to believe that almost all DMs out there would let you grapple with your trunk. The one drawback, um, their single gore attack that they get hits pretty hard for a 3d8 plus 6 damage. But unlike almost every other beast that we've been shifting into throughout our career, they do not have multi-attack. We can solve that by getting extra attack, because yes, if we have extra attack, we can, in fact, make two attacks as a wild-shaped creature if we take the attack action. Um, and, and again, that is different than the multi-attack action, right? Elephants don't have multi-attack. They just get one attack, but with extra attack, we could make two of those big gore attacks. So now the elephant, I think, is arguably even better than the Earth Elemental. They're not as tanky, but they're stronger, they're bigger, and they hit harder. And, and this is why we took uh, the piercer feet, by the way, as the gore attack that elephants make with their tusks is uh, piercing damage. So now we would get to reroll one of the attack's damage die once per turn. So like if you get a one, basically reroll it. Um, and one extra die if we crit. Um, your dice are only d8s, three d8s, right? So that's not amazing, but it's something. It's a little damage bump. So, final damage report then at level 17 assumes that we are making two gore attacks against a grapple target that we're holding in our wall of thorns, um, upcast to a 7th level for 8d8 damage on a failed deck save, plus a bonus action attack from our little baby elephant now, who is adorable, against an enemy with a 10 armor class. Uh, and a plus zero to their deck save, we would do 90 damage per round on average. And against an enemy with an 18 armor class and a plus eight to their deck save, which is hard to come by, but anyway, they exist, um, 62 damage per round. So really quite strong. Final thoughts. Um, this, this character ends up being a pretty good sustained damage per round character uh, when you can sort of have access to your wild shape, right? Um, you end up, we end up at a, uh, at a tier score of 52, um, meaning that it's tied for second place in my tier two sustained uh, DPR builds. So again, check them out in the, uh, in the video description. Um, and if you don't know what the tier stuff means, you can check out uh, my video on ranking my builds. Um, I don't think I have enough cards left to link to it here, but um, if you just search for that. Anyway, they're, they're second place in tier two, uh, tied with actually the Spore Beast. Um, so go Team Druid, I guess. Um, I love how much variety you get with this build. It, you know, it's the same basic concept throughout most of the character's career, but, you know, first you're playing as a brown bear, uh, then a polar bear, then an elemental, then an elephant. Um, maybe a scorpion or a, or a giant snake or a giant lizard thrown in there once in a while, dragging enemies over thorns sometimes, holding them into fire or, or you know, a wall of thorns other times, or maybe moonbeam, right? Um, and then also sometimes getting to be a great controller and support character too. Uh, such variety and, and so many, um, I think, fantastic story moments as you take on new, more powerful, you know, beast forms. Um, I love this character and I want to play him really badly. And I love you guys because you're amazing. And I thank you so much for all of your support, for watching. Um, you know, please, as always, like and subscribe and comment and consider joining and tune in tomorrow for session one of Tales of Anaria. I can't wait to share that with you guys. Hope you're excited and uh, hope you have a fantastic day. I'll talk to you soon.